Our guest today on Meet the Press is Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who is in San Francisco. On our panel of reporters in Washington, G.C., you have just met Lawrence Spivak. Our other reporters today are Tom Wickert of the New York Times, James J. Kilpatrick of the Richmond News Leader, and John Chancellor of NBC News. We'll continue the questions now with Mr. Wicker. Uh, Dr. King, you said a moment ago that Alabama was a state that uh, gives respectability to the resistance and defiance of the law. And you listed uh, uh, an observance of the law by local agencies in the South as one of the cardinal aims that you were seeking. Uh, yet on March the 9th, you led the second march on Montgomery in uh, violation of a federal injunction not to march. You said that order was unjust. And John Lewis, one of your colleagues, said that the Negroes had a constitutional right to march injunction or no injunction. Now, was that in keeping with the spirit of nonviolence and the restraint that has always characterized your movement? And could you explain your reasoning in defying the court order that day? Well, let me say two things to that, Mr. Wicker. First, uh, I did not consider myself defying a court order that particular day. I consulted with my attorneys before the march, and they stated that uh, they felt that it was an invalid order and that uh, it would not uh, be, that I would not be in contempt of court uh, violating uh, the court order if I led the march uh, to the point of having a moral confrontation with the state troopers at the point where the people were brutalized on Sunday. So I still don't consider that uh, breaking a court order or breaking what I consider an unjust law. On the other hand, I must be honest enough to say uh, that I do feel that there are two types of laws. One is a just law and one is an unjust law. I think we all have moral obligations to obey just laws. On the other hand, I think we have moral obligations to disobey unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. I think the distinction here is that when one breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust, he must do it openly, he must do it cheerfully, he must do it lovingly, he must do it civilly, not uncivilly, and he must do it with a willingness to accept the penalty. And any man who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and willingly accepts the penalty by staying in jail in order to arouse the conscience of the community on the injustice of the law is at that moment expressing the very highest respect for law. Well, I can, I can sympathize with a good deal of that, but it seems to me you get into a very difficult point here uh, at which uh, one man's conscience is, is set, in fact, above the conscience of society, which, is, which has uh, invoked the law. Uh, how are we to uh, enforce law when a doctrine is preached that, that one man's conscience may tell him that the law is unjust when other men's conscience don't tell them that? I think you enforce it and I think you deal with it by not allowing anarchy to develop. I do not believe in defying the law. As many of the segregationists do, I do not believe in evading the law as many of the segregationists do. Uh, the fact is that most of the segregationists and racists that I see are not willing to suffer enough for their beliefs in segregation, and uh, they are not willing to go to jail. I think the chief norm for guiding the situation is the willingness to accept the penalty. And I don't think any society can call an individual irresponsible who breaks the law and willingly accepts the penalty if conscience tells him that that law is unjust. And I think that uh, this is a long tradition in our society. It's a long tradition in biblical history. Uh, Medchak uh, uh, and Abednego broke an unjust law, and they did it because they had to be true to a higher moral law. Uh, the early Christians practiced civil disobedience in a superb manner. Academic freedom would not be a reality today if it had not been for Socrates and if it had not been for Socrates' willingness to practice civil disobedience. And I would say that in our own history, there's nothing that expresses uh, a massive civil disobedience any more than the Boston Tea Party, and yet we give this to our young people and our students 
as a part of the great tradition of our nation. So I think we're in good company when we break unjust laws, and I think those who are willing to do it and accept the penalty are those who are part of the saving of the nation.